Good morning, good morning. Just saying hello to all of those who are logging in right now. We're going to have a, uh, a five minute kind of grace period for those to those folks to remember that it's noon and to log in. Um, so we are all here um, and we'll be doing the welcome and opening shortly, but I just wanted to let the few folks who have already registered, I mean, um, logged in on time to just say, hey, this is Talana Jones, by the way. I'll apologize in advance if you hear bells. That is the church very close to my home. I don't know where you all are, but it's actually a beautiful day here in central New York. I'm from Brooklyn, but I'm currently in Syracuse. Um, and we get a lot of rain in the summer, so it's actually a sunny day. We will be utilizing the chat space and not the question area. So if you have thoughts, ideas, things that you want to share, please feel free to utilize the chat area. I'll go over this again in our housekeeping section. Milka, are you on? Hello? Yes. I'm sorry. It's okay. I, I had to step away for a second. No, you're okay. In the chat area, I don't be. Hello? Yes. Sorry, you were breaking out for a second. Can you say that again? Sure. In the chat area, uh -huh. I don't see an option to select all participants. Or all attendees. Uh, so you just sent a chat, a chat to all of us. So I think we're all able to see it. Okay, because it says organizers and panelists only. So I just wanted to. Oh, check. mine says. Uh, okay, I'll check the settings because mine says to all audience. Okay. But I'll double check that setting. Okay. If not, then I'll just read the questions and then we'll we'll do it the same way we did it last time. Okay, okay. Thank okay. You. No problem. Maybe because I shouldn't be chatting to all since I'm the presenter. Ha 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 ha. 
<laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> I'll double check the settings and see if, if that's something that I can um, tweak around. No problem. Actually, if any of the attendees are in here, um, if you can go ahead and type into chat, make sure you select all um, and just say hello to one another. That would be great. And that way maybe we can see if that's going to work. Okay. And it's also, it's also 12.05. So I think we're yes. going to give folks one more minute, and then um, you guys can go ahead and introduce. Okay. So I'm Milka Takata. I'm the IT director here at Synergia Inc. Uh, my name is Godfrey Rivera. I'm the parent trainer in our uh, Metropolitan Parent Center. And my name is Talana Jones, and I will be your presenter today regarding leadership and advocacy, advocacy skill building 101. Um, thank you all for attending. We're so excited to be able to continue our conversation from last week around vision um, for your children and their outcomes. We talked a lot about meaningful outcomes last week. And so we want to take it a step further and just talk about some skills that you would have, that you would like to have if you wanted to become an advocate. We think that families are always their child's first advocate, um, but to take it one step further and continue to build some leadership skills, if you would like. All of these will be necessary as your child gets older, and so I'm excited to have you join us today. This is sponsored by Synergia. Um, and I thank you so much to send here for uh, allowing this opportunity for me to engage families and professionals um, around leadership and advocacy. So let's begin. So this is the agenda for today. Um, as I said, welcome to everyone who is joining us from near and far. We will be having an overview around, um, sorry, I'm my I apologize. We will have an overview um, about is there a difference between leadership and advocacy? I think that question is really important. Sometimes people use the word interchangeably. Um, and I think there is a bit of a difference. Uh, and then where to start, right? Where are we gonna start? Vision and sharing your personal story. We'll talk about how your personal story is deeply connected to the vision that you have. Um, when the personal becomes the political, that moment when your personal story is connected to policy and how to bring it on home. So how to share the information you learn with your community and other families will be a topic. As well as some um, kind of tips around, you know, effective communication and um, conflict communication will be sprinkled in between those things. A little debrief and hopefully have opportunity for questions and answers. If you have any questions while the webinar um, is going on, please type them into chat, and specifically the chat area. I know you have an area that says questions, um, but we wanna use, we wanna try to use the chat area today so that other people can see the types of questions that folks are asking. Uh, either Gottfried or Milka will read those aloud and um, Gottfried and I will take a crack at answering them. Um, if we do not get to all of the questions, we will definitely send out a Word document to all registered attendees with the answers to your So this is my family. My name is Talana Jones, as I mentioned. I know a lot of people see it written and pronounce it Talana but it is Talana. Um, in the far left-hand corner is my son and his dad. Um, in the middle, my, that's my son and the son Kareem and his cousin. They both go to high school together here in Syracuse, New York. And of course, that's him <laughs> in the middle, being the fly guy that he is. And then that's us in the corner. That's who's talking to you today. Um, 
enjoying him and I were enjoying the Syracuse University Arlington. He's the reason why I do this work, why I came into asking questions and trying to seek as much as So he has more pictures than I. I just wanted you to know what I look like. But he is the reason why all of this and my journey began as a parent advocate and my own leadership around his life. And so let's just get in because we only have an hour with one another. <laughs> so uh, is there a leader, is there a difference between advocacy and leadership? And I think it's important for us to have um, the same kind of language when we are listening to this information so you know what some of my thoughts are around this. But this definition of advocacy I took right from the Center here website because I think it was just a really good way to explain what advocacy is. So as a parent of a child with a disability, you are your child's first and lifelong advocate. You know and understand your child better than anybody else, and your experiences are valuable and can be used to obtain and or improve services for your child. I think that is absolutely critical. Um, and I think the key here is that you know and understand your child. It doesn't mean you know everything about the system. It doesn't mean that you know everything about the laws that exist or um, even what's supposed to happen in school, but you do know your child. And that is as important and expertise knowledge, equally so to the professionals that sit around those tables with you um, and who come to service you in your home and anywhere else. And that is true. You get to see aspects of their life that no one does. And you sharing those experiences are critical. And that in essence is advocacy. For leadership, I see leadership more as an act, if you will. Um, and so the act of leadership is the ability to empower others to achieve a collective set of goals for a progressive future. Parent leadership is successfully achieved when parents and practitioners build partnerships that affect, sorry about the typo, that affect their own families, other families and their communities. And so as you know, when you're doing advocacy work for yourself, you can certainly advocate on behalf of others. Um, but advocacy really starts at home. When you shift into leadership, while you may use some principles of leadership within your advocacy, leadership starts to broaden this understanding of what it is to advocate and really have you begin to look at the world around you, your community around you, and how these things, how the, the issues impact your family, other families, and their and your surrounding community. So I think it's that next step up, if you will, um, to really uh, see how your story is included in other stories and how your community is impacted by what's happening to you all. And really working to make sure that that is um, a collective goal versus just something that you need for your family. It's, it's critical to the other. So where to start? Because I think if we're going to talk about setting collective goals, you have to have your own type of vision. And so when sharing your personal story, I think it's, uh, I ask a lot of questions. I tend to ask more questions than I have answers for, um, because I think it's a great strategy <laughs> um, for leadership. It's one of the things that I use often. Even if I do know the answer, I still might pose a question. Um, so why do we advocate for services? I think that's really important. Why do we do the advocacy that we do? And after you think about your answer, because for me, that's a personal answer as to why we go so fiercely for our children. I have some thoughts about that, but I think it's important to reflect on why do you advocate for services and supports for your child? Um, and once you do that, after you think about that answer, consider some of these questions as well. What dreams do you have for your child when they grow up? Have you dreamed for your child <laughs> at all? Um, do you want to find? Do you want them to find a job that they love, a partner to grow old with? Um, how about a friend that they could hang with? Maybe a college or trade school that they can learn. Have you asked your own, your child, or any other child, what do they want to be when they grow up or do? 
for a reason. The reason I think these questions are important is because some, I don't know if you remember um, that moment when you got the diagnosis. And I mean, that's true. We never forget, honestly, the moment you received the diagnosis um, or that you found out your child had a developmental delay because not all of us have the opportunity um, or the ability to have a diagnosis for our child. Our children might just be delayed in some areas or have multiple things happening. So there's not one particular diagnosis. But the moment you receive that information, it's usually um, pretty shocking and often have a list of issues and complications that will happen for your child's life. And those things sometimes can take away from everything else that your child is. My son has Down syndrome. Um, I remember getting the list of all of the things that could go wrong since he had an extra chromosome. So from blindness to issues with hearing, issues around his heart, being more susceptible to leukemia, being more susceptible um, to just overall health issues. Um, they so much it told me as the moment that he was born around the fact that people with Down syndrome can get dementia. I mean, he just got here in the world and we were already talking about what was happening to him at 40. Um, and so, right, they had a particular type of vision for his life. And so I kind of had to reclaim that vision for him um, and think about him in a different way. And that was active work um, because they gave me one story of who he was. And, I, and since then, I have been reworking that story for everyone who comes into contact with him because that story was not his story. Some of it has been, and I think that's important to be honest about. We have definitely had some health issues. We have definitely had um, some challenges and struggles still do while he's in school. Um, and I'm sure he will have some more, um, but that is part of his disability and it's part of him. It is not the totality of him. And I think that's really key and, to, and really important to what drives my advocacy for the things that we get to help him and assist him in his life. So remember, these are moments that we reclaim who our children are. And because we know them so well, we get to share that type of information with folks. And so we know our children face a number of hurdles due to their, due to their being labeled with a disability um, and the low expectations that some people have for who they can be in their life. This is why it's important to use our voice, to share our dream for who they are and who they can be. And don't take this sentence lightly. This is why I posed those questions in the beginning because that doesn't always come easy for every family. And so it may be a challenge to see um, whether or not um, your, your child who is currently having serious medical issues will ever be able to work at a job. Um, maybe they won't be, but having a job is not the totality of life. It is not what makes a quality life, right? And so how else do we think, think about that? So that's why I asked you to reflect before because we can share who they are currently and who they can be with the assistance of other programming. And so this idea, we are so powerful as families to be able to shape for people a vision. And so this vision helps create an individualized family plan and or, and or <laughs> an individualized education plan with your team that can help them meet the goals set forth by the IDEA. And I always mention these because, you know, when we think about the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, short, uh, long for IDEA, we often think about um, the language of appropriateness, um, special education services and supports, you know, our rights, et cetera. But I think it's always key to mention that in that law, in the findings at the beginning, Congress talked about equality of opportunity, full participation, independent living, economic self-sufficiency for individuals with disabilities. So I think that is really this opportunity, this participation in life in the community and independence. And that always stood out to me because that's a particular type of vision, and that means these plans are helping them to meet that. And so between us shaping our, our personal stories and what's culturally appropriate and right for our families individually, we also can think about these larger goals that Congress set forth 
um, for the plans. So they're not just here for the sake of um, being created, right? They really are a roadmap to get to these goals. And so in those meetings, the place to tell your story, the first time we often tell our story is in those meetings. Um, and so while you might have a parent interview where they gain all kinds of information, the family, your family story becomes that much more critical because it's your life, right? Um, the key to advocacy though, is how and when you choose to tell that story. Um, and so it may be important in your individualized family service plan meeting to mention that in your culture, grandma is the rule setter, <laughs> yes? And if you don't pass things by grandma, this, this is not going to happen. And so that means that she has to be present at those meetings, right? And then you can talk about how a role in the family and what that means. And that is, that's where you see those stories kind of change and shape the way um, planning happens. Because if grandma is not available, then you as a family might say, well, then we can't have these meetings. And then you can share with them why that's super important to you. Um, it could be cultural reasons, it can be other reasons. Um, you know, you can talk about lots of different things. It was really important for me um, to have people recognize that my family is pretty extended and that they would wanna be a part of it. And so it really was key to our service planning that um, my family, my extended family was there. When we got to IEPs, um, I let them know that, uh, you know, I shared a story about my son's communication. I was very clear about the fact that he was a young black, boy who didn't have um, a lot of communication skills at that time um, and that that was my priority because I was really concerned about his um, connections with different levels of authority later on in life and how that might get him into further trouble and cause him harm if he didn't understand people or if people couldn't understand him. Um, and so that was a deep set fear. And that's why that became my immediate priority for it. I didn't want him to talk for the sake of talking, um, even though he has not stopped talking since we've given him all types of tools <laughs> to share information. Um, he is nothing but uh, loud, um, no longer silent. Um, so those days are over, but um, he is not necessarily clear to people who are not used to speaking with him. And so it's still a concern of mine. It's still a deep set concern of mine. But I think it put everyone on notice that when we talked, when we had to have long conversations about communication, that they understood where I was coming from and why that was such a priority for me. And it became a priority for them because they, they found my story to be something that they never really had to think about um, because we had some different cultural um, backgrounds and settings. And so again, I will probably say this multiple times because I think when we talk about advocacy, I absolutely want families to know laws. I want them to know the rules and the regulations, but you can always Google them, look them up, ask a friend to share that with you. But innate to you is your stories about um, how what's happening to you and what's happening around you impacts your family right? You have that already. You don't need to Google that. That is your lived experience. And I just, I just want to always mention how powerful that is, because that is the key. That's where leadership starts. Being able to make things happen for your own family, when you have that solidified, you will be able to take on these other pieces that I'll mention later on. Sorry, that was a bit of a soapbox, but you know, okay. <laughs> Um, so what's effective storytelling? And I think I mentioned this too um, just now. When children are in early intervention, it might be helpful to talk about your birth story, as I just did. As they grow older, you may want to tell a different part of that story um, or tell a new story. So communication was my newer story once he got older. But um, for example, this specific story about how I interacted with therapist or preschool teacher, you might have those experiences 
and you want your story to highlight the current issue at hand. So if you really want communication to happen between your therapist or with your preschool teacher, say because in early intervention, you might not have had a lot of communication with your therapist. And so now you go in and you're really like, I need to have communication with my preschool teacher. Make sure you share the story that when your therapist didn't have communication with you, right? You felt like you were out of the loop. You felt um, that you needed more information that you didn't have access to. And so this is the real reason why communication with your teacher is driving it, not just because the teacher should be talking to you, right? We could say that, we could say, we can say those things, but it becomes, um, you offer a little nuance into who you are and who your family's life is, when we can add that narrative to it. Um, and so your story can con connect the dots for the professionals in you and your child's life. Critical points to sharing your story. I cannot, I cannot stress this first one enough. Be honest, right? There is no need to add anything to a story that did not happen. You can talk about how something made you made you feel and remain honest. So you can you can certainly tell the facts of a story, but the enormity or the immenseness of how it made you feel, if you were deeply troubled by it, if you were angry, if it caused you um, deep emotions, depressions, you can talk about that all day long, but you don't need to make the story any more or any less um, because you think it will impact them in a different way. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, th there's no need to embellish because the last thing you want to do is have someone who was really touched by your story, go check out the story and then someone else say, that didn't happen like that or um, that's not what happened at all, right? You want to remain credible. You want to remain somebody that people um, can rely on when you're sharing information, just even in the future, right? As you, especially if you're thinking about leadership. So be honest, right? What happened to you, as I mentioned, your lived experience is powerful. So just be who you are um, and share when you need to. You don't need to share everything. You don't need to share everything. But when you do share, just, just be as honest as possible. And building trust is key to developing leadership. Be clear, I just said. Clearly, I have written this succinctly. <laughs> you do not have to tell every piece of your life. But if it is important to help people understand where you're coming from, then include it. Always make sure, though, it's connected to the issue at hand. So unless you're talking about something new completely, you don't have to tell every single story that you need to. Um, some of us love to overshare. I talk a lot. So I might be, you know, uh, a culprit. <laughs> but when you're when you're specifically doing advocacy work and leadership work, you wanna you wanna be able to use those stories to illuminate some kind of conversation at hand. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. And if possible, include a positive story. I talked about challenges, but I have to tell you, it is important for us to share stories about what works or who helped us in a good way. These are the, mo the moments that people help us and others understand, help others understand when the system actually works, right? Um, and so I'm able to talk about my physical therapist who after sharing um, a conversation, she wanted him to crawl. I was like, why? He can get from point A to point B pretty, pretty easily by doing a snake belly crawl. And I asked her, why do you need to do this? over and over again, he hates crawling, he's crying, it's not pleasant for anybody. She talked about building trunk strength. And I said later on, okay, well, you know, my priority is for him to stand and walk because he is getting heavy and I have to run errands and we only have one car in the house. That's a quick story, right? Um, and she said, okay, well, then we could, we could, you know, use trunk strength, we can build trunk strength in a different way. This is where you see a provider actually adapting and listening to family's concerns and sharing a priority and then moving on to make it to work and do something different. That's the provider doing what we ask them to do. If no one ever hears that story and we only hear the challenges, then we don't have any examples of what happened when things work well. And I think that's really key. And as we move on to policy, you'll see how more, how that becomes that much more important. 
And so I also took this from Center Here's website because again, it is an amazing website full of lots of resources that if you are a family who has joined today, um, you should definitely check out since they are a parent center. Um, but six skills to being an effective advocate are understanding your child's disability. Um, you, you know, this helps you in every single way um, to be able to ask for types of different types of services, supports, and accommodations. And this is the outcome of for early intervention. It's something that they actually have to report out to the federal government on. Um, and so please ask and, and ask everywhere you go for folks to help you understand how your child's disability impacts their lives. Um, what do they know? What can they share? What kind of information can you get to continue to understand that? Because that changes as they grow. And so that's an important, it's a baseline skill that you need to have because that's the type of information that you get to share as they get older. Know who the key players are. You know, Godfrey, do you want to expand on that one at all? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was about to add this. Thanks very much, Alana. Uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. These six principles or skills that she's identifying are incredibly important for the parent to become an effective advocate. Uh, many of our parents go to the IEP meetings having no understanding of their child's disability. So they really can't participate meaningfully. They can't even ask the right questions because they don't have an understanding of how that disability affects the way their child, uh, you know, learns and functions. So, uh, and all the other points that are identified here are really very important for that parent to go to the meetings prepared to uh, have a meaningful conversation with all the people that are participating in, in her child's education. So please. Uh, do everything you can to uh, develop these skills. They will help you uh, m uh, ensure that your child has necessary and appropriate services that will help him or her for life after school. Absolutely. Thank you, Godfrey. And if you're a for and if you're a person who works with families and you're on today, please, this is what you assist families with, right? Because sometimes of a, a, a person like me. I was not well organized. Well, now I have more folders than a little bit. I can't even find a place to file everything. Um, but I do have each year's <laughs> folder of information that I kept to ensure that any letter that I wrote, any IEP that he received, um, any kind of email communication, I would ask other people to print it out for me because I don't have a printer at home. Um, just to keep those kinds of communications because that was really important. But I didn't learn that until even as effective as I was in getting him services and support, um, I didn't understand what it really meant to be well organized until somebody said I didn't do something that I knew I did. And so I had to go back and get something and that was really hard to find. And going to another training, I was like, oh, this is why you give out notebooks, okay. Okay, I'll work on that. Um, so you don't ha you you may not have all of these skills right away, but this is something co to continue to work on. What I am going to highlight though um, is the use of clear and effective communication and knowing how to resolve disagreements. Because I think in any case, if you're moving from your advocacy to your 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 personal um, your child um, and your own self um, and beginning to talk about other families. I think it's really important that we have clear and effective communication and that we do know how to resolve disagreements both on, on behalf of ourselves and as well as when folks are not coming to consensus immediately um, as we talk about families when we're in leadership roles. So. Clear and effective communication. I hate writing, but I love letters and emails. The reason that's the case, so if I had to write you a paper right now, it would probably take me a billion days. But if you ask me to write a letter or an email to my school, I'm probably typing it on my smartphone as I'm leaving the school <laughs> to get out communication as soon as I can. But letters provide both you and the school with a record of ideas, concerns, and suggestions. This is the age where we feel like, you know, we give a call, we ask a question, um, we talk to somebody really quickly, they share information with us, 
And then you might find yourself at a meeting and either the person said that's not what they said or that you heard something differently or that you didn't ask that question or maybe they never received a call. Um, and so it's hard to follow up with those types of communication, those types of informal communication, or if you're talking to them in person, those types of informal communications are hard to um, prove essentially that they that they existed, especially if someone is saying that they're not. Um, the benefits of letter writing is also, it gives you time. It gives you time to think through things. Um, and so putting your thoughts on paper or in an email gives you the opportunity to take as long as you need and to, to do what? To state your concerns. Or as I said, you can remain positive. You can be commending folks on what is happening for your child. Don't underestimate that. I think, you know, folks in the system are used to, in multiple systems, education, early intervention, um, OPWDD, uh, Office of People with Developmental Disabilities, and other, other service organizations that assist families don't often get the positive feedback that they could use. So if something is done well, I really implore you to write a letter and say thank you um, and state why um, it was really helpful. Those things help keep people going who are committed to this work and um, it really behooves families to do that if they can. Um, but sometimes you state your concern and you know, you put it down and you wanna make you wanna make sure you're clear. And sometimes in the heat of the moment, we're not always necessarily clear. And so putting things down on paper in an email helps you to kind of get it all out and then kind of look it over. So you think over what you've written. And sometimes you decide to make changes. Maybe you wrote all of it down and you didn't even have a question. You just were you just wanted to get out of frustration about something that happened. Maybe you really did have a question, but it's getting lost in um, everything else that you're talking about um, because you're, you might be talking about multiple things. So it helps you to organize and make some changes. And then I do this and it has changed my writing for the better. It has changed my email writing um, and has calmed me down um, because having someone else read over the letter and make suggestions, someone who might be close to you or someone who may not know everything about the system. You can choose, you can, you can have multiple people read it if you want to. But I think just having someone else's eyes look at it and just give you some pointers um, is really important. And you can take or leave those suggestions, right? But I think it's really helpful to have someone else read, read it over for maybe spelling, grammar, anything else. And then really to see if you're getting at what you want to get at. I think letters also give the opportunity to go over what's been suggested or discussed. Because on the other end, while an angry phone call or an emotional response in school, as you're having a conversation with somebody, um, still allows you to get your frustration out um, or you to state your concerns, it doesn't give the opportunity for the person who was listening to really kind of mull over all of the things that you brought up because of how it was communicated. And so in a letter and email, folks may have the opportunity to really look over and examine and investigate each of the things or points that you brought up to really give you a more robust answer. Um, lots of confusion and misunderstanding can be avoided by writing down thoughts and ideas. Plus, I just think it's important for families to have a record of the things that they're requesting, um, the things that they're stating, because, you know, when it comes to your due process, right, um, you know, the time that you send in written communication usually has some outlined timelines um, according to the IDEA. So, for example, when you request your child's records, I hear people verbally request the ability to look at their child's education records all the time. Um, and the first thing I do is share with them to, you can go ahead and verbally request it, but go home and write an email and follow up with the actual written request. Um, the IDEA gives you the right to look at all of your child's education records. And I, I implore you to do so um, because this record includes 
his or her identification, evaluation, the educational placement. I can't tell you how many times upon review of an educational record, we realized that families did not know what their children's educational placement was. Um, they thought that their child was in an inclusive setting, but it turns out that the program was actually um, a self-contained setting um, and that their child no longer had like a grade that they were in. And they had no clue as to what that actually meant until they they read what it was on the IEP. They didn't know where to find it on the IEP. And so record reviews allow you to kind of go over the records on your own time, not within the IEP meeting. And you know, you can find some really interesting things there. Um, as I said, in the type of special education program, you also have the right to ask the school to explain and interpret the records for you. This is really key because you, you know, sometimes you get a file as thick as I don't know what, depending on how long your child has been in school. And it really, it, it really can be overwhelming. So you do have the right to hack the school to explain and, and let you know what some of the documents mean. Um, and you will probably have to schedule a time for them to do that with you. You also may receive, um, they also may charge you a reasonable fee for making a copy, but they cannot charge you a fee for retrieving or letting you review the records. And I say this because in our own children's advocacy, you know, we, we need to see what's being written down on the other end. And although we receive copies of the IEP, I tend to do a record review at the end of the year or, two years at least, um, just because I wanna see what types of IEPs they have on record for him. I wanna see the copies that teachers are given. Um, is it different from mine that I received? Was something added? Was something taken away? Were the updates that people said that they were gonna make, did they actually make it? Even if I receive the copy at home, is it in his file? Um, and is it up to date? Do they still have his old records from when he first entered into school, what does that mean for his records? Um, who has access to them? Who reviews them? Those are the kinds of questions that I ask the current school that he's in because he's in high school now and things have changed since he was in elementary school. In elementary school, he was alternatively assessed. He's no longer alternatively assessed in high school. And um, I don't know if I always want people to be able to have, you know, different types of information. So we talk about that. Um, and, and I asked, you know, who has access to what? And so that was explained to me, um, but that gives you an opportunity to really kind of delve deep into your own child's um, personal education history. So that moves us into disagreements, right? Because if we go back, we talked about the letter email writing, you stated your concerns, um, and so you might use a letter to request a meeting. And in that meeting, you might want to state your concerns about a particular issue with a teacher or a decision made at the IEP meeting or the IFSP meeting. Um, all kinds of conflicts arise when a team has to work together to come up with a decision. And so, you know, it's important for us as advocates and as parent leaders to have successful conflict resolution because it is going to happen. It is going to happen. Um, I'm not one of those folks who um, agrees that, you know, parents have the right to get every single thing that they ask for. Sometimes, sometimes compromise is important. I do believe that we can state why the things that we want for our children are absolutely important to them. But I also believe that we also need to think about what that means for their time of day. What does that look like when it's actually operationalized? How does that look in school? Can it be done in school? Can it be done somewhere else? You know, just continuing to keep an open mind. And we'll see as we talk about this a little bit more. Um, because, you know, you assume positive intention, right? And sometimes, and I don't have this on the the... PowerPoint, but when we assume positive attention, then we don't think that folks are necessarily out to get us. Um, and I ask for professionals to do the same, offer that same kind of um, grace to families as well. And I think that word grace is really important. 
So successful conflict, conflict resolution um, compri comprises, Lord have mercy, of three aspects. So desire and necessity for the conflict to be resolved. You don't want to have, you don't want to go in with wanting to fight ongoing. Like you don't want that fight to be ongoing. Like you want the issue to be resolved. Understanding of possible barriers. So what is getting in the way of it being resolved? And so the choice of method of conflict resolution. So how, the how, what are we gonna use in order to fix it or to get to the resolution? So it's important to express the desire and necess the necessity for the conflict to be resolved. You want, you're asking for something and even though someone might be disagreeing with you, the goal is to get some type of service and support um, that you wanna have happen for your child whatever that is. And so this is where we go back to sharing a story. You can illuminate that for them, make that come to life. Why are you here? Why are you um, disagreeing with whatever choice that they're making? And share a story about why this becomes that much more important for your child. So like I mentioned earlier, you may share a cultural practice about your communication style and why that's important to know about you and your child. I actually speak often about the fact that my son does not look you directly in the eye. And so we had an issue with someone who really talked about his behavior. And once we really got down to it, you know, and they kept sending him out of class for being disrespectful or disruptive, I knew my son wasn't being disruptive. And so we had to have a kind of mediation of sorts, not a, uh, mediation as according to IDEA, but a, a sit down conversation. And I share that um, even though I have a cultural practice of looking me in the eye when I talk to you, and so I recognize that they had a shared cultural practice of that as well, that he has Down syndrome. His eyes roam all over the place due to his uh, visual impairment. He also wears glasses, but he has. Um, he doesn't have a lazy eye anymore, but he did. And so it becomes a struggle to hold your gaze, right? And so that really wasn't about his Down syndrome as much as it was his visual issues, um, but they needed to move on past whether or not his communication style, his communication style was to look you in the eye because as long as he was listening, he would share these other types of responses, um, both via, uh, his verbal response and his body response and that they needed to pay more attention to that. Um, and so we were able to resolve it. That's something light. Um, but of course there are, there are times where it can get, you know, pretty, um, uh, down in the muck. So expressing the desire and necessity is important from the beginning. You can write this down before you get to the meeting to make sure that even if you experience different emotions, you can say everything you need to. I will offer one more example. When we were um, when we were transitioning from early into from preschool into kindergarten, um, I, I had a CSE chair who shared that Tajay should be in a segregated class setting because he had Down syndrome. That was her because um, I disagreed. He had been in an inclusive setting up until that point. And we wanted to maintain that for him. And she shared that the district normally puts children with Down syndrome in segregated settings. We can say all of the things that are wrong with what I'm saying, her response is, right? Um, but clearly we were at an impasse because she was the chair of the meeting. And as families and my teachers who were there to support us, um, we, did, we just disagreed. And so it got frustrating going around in circles, et cetera. And so ultimately it was his father who shared the importance of an inclusive class setting for Tajay at that moment in his life. He learned a lot by looking at his peers and that if his peers were on task and um, they were learning to read and they were moving ahead of him, he was really inspired to do the work just like they did the work. And so he needed to be in a class where people were advanced. And he also needed to be in a class where people he could assist with because he really liked the opportunity to be a leader in his class. And that was a story his, he shared. And that was really powerful for the other people who were on the IEP. 
she remained pretty incessant and um, said to me, um, well, you know, that's okay. We'll give him the setting. Either way, he'll be labeled uh, something else and he'll be in a secluded class setting later on in life. She was very mean. Um, and I was very upset. I, I can't even lie. I probably didn't react in the best way. But as we finished, as the meeting went on, so we took a break. I think it's important to remember to take a break. You don't have to end the meeting, but you can take a break. I just wrote down a note to her about the things that I was feeling. I didn't say them out loud. I didn't get, I didn't give them to her, but I did email it later. Um, a little bit nicer than what I wrote in the meeting. <laughs> But I did communicate the fact that these were these, these issues, this was an issue. And that I named specifically this first one, a difference in cultural values and norms. I didn't like the way she talked to me. I didn't like the way she um, um, presented information to us. I thought she was very dismissive. And, um, you know, in my, in my culture, you know, tone of voice, practice, how you talk to people, um is something that just is a sign of disrespect from the beginning and i that could be across cultures but in other places you kind of talk directly and you know it, it doesn't it's no skin off your back right so that that might be a difference there and it might be an issue of possible resistances because i was more resistant to anything she said due to her body like the way she held herself um so anything she said to me i wasn't actually going to listen <laughs> even if she was saying the right thing. And so over time, I recognized these things about myself and other people. But lack of resources or time, sometimes people are not agreeing to give you things because of the lack of resources or their ability to do so. And so, um, and so they have a hard time operationalizing that. Um, lack of access to information or regulations in the dominant language and previous challenges. Power dynamics are a key piece here. Excuse me, Kalana, may I make a quick point? Sure. Sure thing. Um, you have to understand how important it is uh, when you're having these conversations with the example that Talana just gave, is uh, to document everything, every interaction that you have, every conversation you should, after you finish talking, pull out your pad and write the essence of that conversation. It's going to help you keep track of, of so many things. It may help you if you have to go into a... a an impartial hearing, it's really important. Another thing that we advise parents to do is at the IP meeting when uh, they are talking about services for your child and they are promising you everything, uh, you could ask that person to, can I please have that in writing? Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I understand yes. that this is going to be part of the, my child's IEP program. That's a really good way of holding uh, the, the team members uh, accountable and for you to be aware of what your child's services will look like. That's one of my favorite questions. Can I have that in writing, please? That is a powerful question, and you can see the tides change sometimes in a very different way <laughs> when you do <laughs> ask that question. So thank you, Godspeed. And I will say this just because I've been keeping track of time, and I know that it's 1253, but as the attendees who arrived early know, we started at about 12.05, so we are probably going to go to 1.05, if that is okay with folks, um, just to get through this last bit of information. Um, and so you acknowledge the differences when you deal with those differences up front and ask questions to help you understand the viewpoints. It helps you understand the viewpoints of people around you. But instead of focusing on the differences, try to see the common ground and build on it. Ultimately, it was about an inclusive class 